So, greetings once again from Upstart and Crow, where we have a real treat for you tonight. Uh, my name is Ian Gill, and I'm one of the co-founders of Upstart and Crow, which is a literary arts studio in the heart of Vancouver on Granville Island. Uh, here, we are privileged to work on the unceded territory of the tsleil Squamish and Musqueam nations. And tonight, we are delighted to host the launch of one of the most anticipated books of the year, Harold Johnson's marvelous work of mythopoeic science fiction, the, the Bjorken Sagas. Harold will join me in just a minute and we'll chat about his book. Uh, for those of you joining us, welcome. Uh, you're also welcome to send in questions which we'll collect in the chat and we'll have some time to uh, have some of your questions for Harold at the conclusion of our chat, which will be in about an hour from now. And so Harold Johnson is an upstart and crow. We're thrilled to host a conversation with one of the most thoughtful, clever and prolific writers in our country. Harold, welcome and good evening. Thank you. It's great so, to be here. Um, it's great to have you here. We're so thrilled that uh, you're sharing um, the launch of your book today with uh, our viewers and friends at Upstart and Crow. Um, tell us a little about yourself, uh, where you've lived until recently, the countryside, the land that has shaped you as a person and has absolutely, if I'm not wrong, shaped this incredible story. Uh, and I guess what people really want you to do is tell us about this great book. Okay. Um, we'll start with the writing. The first novel I wrote, I wrote while I was at Harvard, um, Billy Tinker, which got me started. Um, the next nine books I wrote living in a cabin in Northern Saskatchewan on my family's traveling. I recently moved to Gabriola Island where I'm continuing to write. I've got three manuscripts uh, from that perspective, from, from the island. Everything else that I've written comes from looking out the window of the loft in uh, Trapper's Cabin in Northern Saskatchewan and looking out across a lake. I read somewhere that when you looked across the lake, that's how you formed ideas, or when you were waiting for an idea to come, you would just keep staring further and further into the distance until the idea came to you. Is That's a, that's a great way to write. It is. It, it, it works for me. When I'm trying to find the next words, uh, where's the next idea? Where's the next paragraph coming from? The greater the distance that I can look into, um, the better it is. So um, what did you see out there on the lake when the Bjorken sagas came to you? Tell us about this, this particular work, because you're, you're famous, um, I think is a suitable word to say, uh, for your um, fiction and non-fiction, you know, and you've tackled some pretty serious subjects. And here we have you in this um, beautiful fantasy land. How did you get there? And uh, tell us a bit about the story. It comes out of one of those really hard stories. It comes out of Peace and Good Order. I had written Peace and Good Order. Uh, the first draft <clears throat> took me a month and a half. And it was with the editor and we're waiting to do some substantive edits. And when you've written a book in a month and a half, you know that's a big edit that's coming. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to start anything new. But every night as I went to bed, in those minutes before I fell asleep, I tell myself a little story. And I just kept adding on to the story every night until I had this complete saga in my head that I didn't want to write. Because if I started writing it, I knew I'd have to stop, go through that big editing process, and then come back and try and pick it up again. And sometimes ideas get lost that way. <coughs> my son was going to be driving, and I was going to be riding in the back of a vehicle for a few hours. And as I was leaving the cabin, I just grabbed the book off the bookshelf and the cover of it said Hess. 
And I thought I'd grab Herman Hess. And I get in the car, I mean, it's not Herman Hess, it's Karen Hess. And she's written a book about the Dust Bowl, 1930s, Texas and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And the entire manuscript is one single poem. And I read that and my eyes got wide and I said, I can do that. So when I got back from that trip, I started writing Bjorka, which was the first name. And I wrote the first one in two weeks because all of the story was already there. And we sent it off to uh, the publisher. They were excited. What can we do with this? And at first they thought it might be a graphic novel, but the writing style doesn't quite fit with graphic novels. I play little tricks on the reader. And if there's a picture there showing what's going on, I lose the power of the little literary trick that I was playing. So we went back and forth on what it is that we were going to do with this manuscript. And I met with them again when they said, what we want is more. We just want more. Uh, so I went back and I wrote the second and third sagas and submitted it to them again. And all of a sudden they weren't answering the phone and they weren't replying to emails. <laughs> so I phoned them up because I worked with them before. I knew them. I phoned up one of the editors, got a hold of her and, and said, listen, it's okay. I'm gonna love you anyways. Doesn't matter if you publish my book. Uh, you're not gonna hurt my feelings if you say no. I'm still gonna love you guys. You did fantastic work for me before. And they said, yeah, Harold, we just don't know what to do with it. So I gave it back to my agent and she sent it to all of the big houses in New York, but COVID had just hit and New York was shut down. Mm. Nothing going on. Uh, so we tried a few places and then I said, I just, can I have it back? Uh, maybe I'll self-publish it. I like it so much, I'll self-publish it. And my agent said, sure, take it back. Now, I know enough that you never publish anything without a good editor. And the best editor I know is Sean Virgo. He edited all of my early work and he's quite influential in my writing. He's helped to shape me as a writer. So I contact Sean and he says, no, Harold, I'm just way too busy but send it to me anyway. So I send it to him and he gets back to me and says, I see why they're struggling. Publishers are struggling with it. They don't know what to do with it. I recommend that you commit a literary fraud. Say that you found it. Just say one of your Swedish relatives gave it to you. <laughs> so I did. And it was a wonderful writing exercise to write an introduction and a conclusion that bookended the three sagas. Uh, and I really liked that writing. Uh, it was just fresh and nice. And it, it was written in the cabin in Northern Saskatchewan. It's about living in the cabin in Northern Saskatchewan. Uh, an old trapper who uh, left me the three sagas in handwritten notebooks, but they were all written in Swedish. It's a beautiful construction. I mean, it's really, I mean, you owe your editor a uh, Sean a big debt because doing that, it's a, it's clever. Um, it situates you in a good way and it situates you know, where you live in a good way. Um, and it's a, marvelous conceit actually to have, uh, have, have done that. Yeah. And then the other suggestion he made was that he said, Harold, do you know that the Icelandic and Irish sagas are not poems? They're mostly prose mm -hmm. with poetic lines interspersed. You might consider that. Mm -hmm. 
So I did. I took my poetry and I put it back to prose and I loved it. It really worked nicely and left some lines of poetry to tie it all together. Um, so that's the construction of the book. Right. Um, together. So people are going to, uh, you know, they're going to seize upon this book, I'm sure, and be thrilled with it. Um, you, you dedicate the book to your children, your grandchildren, the next seven generations, to this beautiful planet, as you say, to all my relations, and especially to my relatives, the trees. And the trees basically are the star of the show here, uh, the Bjorken trees. Actually, I looked up the, the name Bjorken, and it, the derivation is from the birch tree uh, in uh, older languages. And, uh, um, and these trees are, are living things. They, uh, they're the central characters. Tell us about the Bjorkens. When I went to Sweden to visit my relatives there, I was taught a, a line in Swedish, and uh, do you love me, Nava? And love in Swedish is leaf, and Nava is birch bark. So it's a funny little play between English and Swedish. But the word Bjorka stuck with me. Mm. And so as I was imagining these, this story as I'm laying down to go to bed, um, well, let's go back to my dad's uh, traditions. My mother is Cree, my father came from Sweden. And the first 10 books I've written have always been about Cree, written from a Cree perspective and from a Cree landscape. And this time it felt like maybe I should honor my father as well. So I went to his land. And I went there in the dream world. I haven't spent a lot of time in Sweden. I've been there four or five times, just visiting relatives. I don't know a lot about the country. I don't know a lot about the language. I know others, I've got some very beautiful relatives there. So most of the Bjork and Sagas comes out of the dream world. So I tell myself these stories as I was laying down to go to sleep. And the story stayed with me through the dream world. And I get up early in the morning. I like to get up at five o'clock to begin writing. Because at that time, you're still close to the dream world. So that's another part of the evolution of the Bjorken sagas is they were filtered through the dream world. And the trees were in the dream world. And the dragons and the Valkyries were in the dream world. That's where they came from. So I referred earlier to this as a mythopoeic work of science fiction. I admit I had to look up that word. I read it somewhere and I had to look it up. And I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it properly. Um, but as a very accomplished author of nonfiction, um, why science fiction? What, what does working in myth in this mythological world that you've created, how does that relate to stories you were brought up with or your own culture? Or how does it, how does it help you project and, and contribute something that um, your, your other writing doesn't? I have two storytellers in my life who taught me how to tell stories. Uh, they're both deceased now, one just recently, James Auger. And I traveled with James Auger from Fort McMurray to Uranium City, up the Peace River and across Lake Athabasca. And every landmark on that journey had a story. So I can find my way up the Peace River and across Athabasca with stories. And I learned from him about how to tell stories in the oral tradition. And from Rod McDermott, a few years earlier, I knew him, he was living in Northern Saskatchewan. 
Um, I stopped to visit him and I hadn't seen him in a while and there was a bit of distance between us because of the length of time that I'd been away. And I told him a Wisaki Jack story, one of the trickster stories, mm -hmm. a simple one that everybody knows. And it opened the floodgates and he told me stories for a day and a half. Uh, not just a follow-up story to the one that I told him, he just got into telling stories and uh, it was phenomenal just to sit there and listen to this really old man tell me these stories about Northern Saskatchewan and magic and the power that people used to have. So that's where my storytelling comes from. I've been criticized a few times that I tell instead of show. Mm. And that seems to be something that is taught by academia that it's you now have to only show and never tell. My teachers interspersed telling with showing. Mm. Uh, it was mostly showing, but there's always a little bit of telling, uh, a little filling in the dark spots. So that's the style that I, where I come from. The trees are just I see them as relatives. Those are, uh, there's a space on Gabriola now where I go quite often. It's called Elder Cedar Grove. Mm -hmm. And it's a one and a half kilometer hike through old growth cedar forest. And man, Ian, <clears throat> I take a couple steps down the trail in that forest and the prayer just starts coming by itself. You, I can't walk that trail without praying, without talking to the great mystery and saying, thank you. I love you. Um, thank you for blessing me with all of this beauty. And then to touch the trees. And when you're open to them and you put your hand on a tree, you can feel the life in it. You can feel the energy come down the tree and through your arm. And it's just phenomenal. So these are my relatives that I'm writing about. They're also relatives in distress um, because of uh, colonialism and because of development. Um, and uh, there is a lot of, um, actually, if you'll pardon me, I'll, I wanted to just um, quote you as saying in an interview I read somewhere, I do not distinguish between my personal and my public self. What you see in public is the same as you would see in my private life. The same is true of my writing. I often put a great deal of myself into my work. The hurt I express in my writing is the same hurt that I feel, but then so is the joy. Yeah. Tell me about You've told us just then, you hinted at the joy you feel with these trees, magnificent old growth on Gabriola. Tell me about the hurt that, that, that definitely comes through in the sagas and comes through in a lot of your other work as well. There's never one reason for doing anything. I've got several reasons for moving from Northern Saskatchewan to Gabriola. One, it's my wife's traditional territory. She lived in my territory for 20 years. Now it's time I lived in hers. Another one was I was just sickened by the racism in Saskatchewan, the blatant racism. Well, one of the biggest factors was they came and clear cut my trap line. They cut all of the high ground and only left me muskeg. And that hurt. I couldn't drive south of where we lived and drive past those massive clear cuts without getting so angry and bitter. And I don't want to be an angry, bitter person. I'm ineffectual at 
discussing forestry and forestry practices because I've become so angry that all I can do is utter profanities. Mm -hmm. So that the trees, when they cut the trees in the Bjorken sagas, and the hurt that the people feel when the trees are being cut, that's my hurt. I think a lot of people are feeling that hurt. Frankly, right now, I, you, um, you've come to British Columbia now and you know what's going on with our old growth forests. Um, that's a pain that is spreading and I think is felt by everybody. And uh, you probably feel it too now that you're here. You have that beautiful grove to walk in, but you know that around us, all of that is going away. Yeah. It's not just the forests. And I wrote um, Firewater was a really hard book to write. Peace and Good Order was really hard to write. I put my pain into those books and I needed a reprieve. Mm. So a lot of the Bjorken sagas is Harold Johnson taking care of himself, mm. writing fantasy stepping back from this world where I've been a warrior for too long. It's a beautiful story or collection of stories, beautiful uh, in its composition. Um, uh, we were talking a little before we started rolling the camera here. I was about to say rolling tape. That shows you how old I am. <laughs> uh, on uh, we were talking about um, you mentioned before the tricks you'd like to play for the reader. There is so much shading and so much possibility in the book that and things left unsaid that you, as you were saying before, you you'd like to make them do some work. Tell me more about that. It's a style that I find that I really like. I'm calling it minimalist. I don't describe things to the reader so that they imagine it. I never tell you the color of you has eyes or his hair or what color of clothes he's wearing. I leave that for your imagination because the reader's imagination is much more powerful than anything that I could write. So let them, ha let them have that. And then I put in things for them to discover. Um, I called it tricks earlier when we were talking, but I leave things for the reader to find. And when I'm reading and I discover something that is written, uh, if I discover something in the manuscript that's not written, it excites me, mm. makes me feel good. Mm. Like, like I'm part of the process. So this minimalist style is an invitation to the reader to come into the story process, to imagine a little bit of it. Well, to be, uh, to do some of the work. I was complaining to you before that <laughs> I'm, I'm a lazy reader. I want you to do the work for me. But that gets this minimalist style you were talking about because you know, the Bjorken sagas, um, could easily be a four or five hundred page book. It, you know, it could be in, in our mind's eye a saga or a series of sagas, yeah. you know, the big long stories. Uh, and uh, some might feel a little kind of starved that you you create this amazing world and you don't <laughs> show it all to us. I fill it all in. I used to run sleigh dogs. And when you run sleigh dogs, you feed them really high protein and you don't want a lot of filler in it. Mm -hmm. And your dogs work really well if you don't put a lot of filler in their feed. I think readers work really well too if you just give them the bare bones and the meat and let them put the filler in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. It sounds like Ikea furniture. Right? You, know, you <laughs> give them, make them do all the work. Uh, you give them the, the, out, the outline and make them do all the work. Um, sorry, I, that's offensive to compare your work to Ikea furniture, one of the things I hate the most in the world. But uh, this minimalist style, um, 
uh, I was actually thinking that um, the sagas, you know, there's lots of writers of fantasy we could compare your work to, and uh, uh, and I know you're a fan of uh, fantasy yourself. Um, I was thinking, you know, when I was reading it, um, and others I've talked to, uh, especially in this part of the world, we're very fond of Ursula Le Guin's work. And uh, uh, and then I was rereading some of Ursula Le Guin's work and, you know, the New York Times described her as using a lean but lyrical style to explore issues of moral relevance. And when I heard that, I thought, well, that's, that's why I'm, you, you may or may not like the comparison or the correlation to Ursula Le Guin, but it, it is that lean style but it's unflinching in terms of the way that you delve into subjects of what the Times is referring to as moral relevance. I mean, it's a it's it's a it's a beautiful style, but it does make us all work. I think you just connected some dots for me, and maybe I borrowed uh, from all of the Ursula Le Guin books that I have read that. Maybe it, I didn't make this up on my own. Maybe I borrowed it from her. Well, I'm not sure, I'd have to uh, examine it a bit more. I thought it was my idea. But <laughs> yes, I, I do love that about Ursula Le Guin, her ability to write and the artistry of her writing. To me, that, that's what writing should be about. I'll, I want to create something artistic every time I sit down. Every time I put my ass in the chair in front of my computer, that's the goal. That's what I want to do. I want to create something. And I want to create something that's beautiful. That's what I'm striving for in my fiction writing. Nonfiction writing is just trying to get ideas together and making them understandable to everyone, uh, the lay reader as well as the academic. So um, you really like to write, don't you? I mean, not every writer loves writing. I mean, they, you're a bit, you really like to write. You, uh, you write really, a lot. Yeah, uh, You got the word right. I love writing. I've been a writer all my life. One of my earliest memories is in a cabin in northern Saskatchewan. I'm about four years old and kerosene lamps and I'm on the floor because there's no room on the table. And I've got the Winnipeg Free Press and a brown paper bag and a little stubby pencil and I'm copying the letters from the Winnipeg Free Press onto the brown paper bag, teaching myself to read and write. And I've been a writer ever since. When I was a teenager, I wrote poetry. I think the world could be saved by 13-year-old poets. <laughs> when I was working in, I wrote poetry when I was in the Navy. I started writing short stories when I was mining. And I'd be sitting at a, driving a haul truck and waiting for my turn to get loaded by the shovel. And I'd get out my little clipboard and write something down and, in a story and then, my truck would be loaded and I'd drive and think about what I'm going to write next time I'm parked. And knew all along during the poetry years and the short story writing years that I was just practicing. And someday I'm going to be a writer. And now it's all about practice. And so I tried a whole bunch of different styles. Um, there's a, a few short stories that are Strictly narrative, all you have are two people talking and you're the fly on the wall just listening to a conversation. And how do you work that into a complete story? It was just one of the exercises that I gave myself to play with. I didn't write my first novel until I got to Harvard. And I got invited into a writer's group, which was a fantastic writer's group, uh, Larissa Barrett, Kate Sutherland, and we just encouraged each other. 
There's mm -hmm. no this ripping each other apart to make each other better. It was, if you had something nice to say, you said it, and if you didn't, you just didn't say anything. We were there encouraging each other. And so those, that writing group helped me to grow. I came to the first uh, gathering at Charlie's Kitchen, a little pub in Cambridge, and brought the first chapter of Billy Tinker. And then every week I had to bring a new chapter. And when it was done, just dropped it all together. That is part of my year at Harvard. So you um, you started writing when you were four. Yeah. <laughs> you you first published when you were forty, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Sure. And uh, so at some point, you just decided you're a writer. Like that's what you're going to do. That's all you're going to do. So um, uh, how liberating was that to basically realize that? This is actually who you are. This is what you do. You're not all these other things. You have this amazing career of dozens of different jobs and everything else, especially your work as a prosecutor and as a defense lawyer with your law degree. But then you decided you wanted to write. I mean, that's been liberating to be able to do that and nothing else. Well, writing has always been part. There wasn't no transition period. I was a writer before. And uh, after I turned 40, I'm just a published writer. Uh, and that's the only difference. The love of writing has always been there. Practicing law interfered in the writing um, a bit because it interfered in the reading. Mm -hmm. To be a writer, you should read lots as well. And for 20 years as a lawyer, first as defense counsel, then as a crown prosecutor, I spent all day reading really badly written police reports. And when I got home at the end of the day, the last thing I wanted to do was more reading. I wanted to get outside, take my dogs for a run, go cut some firewood, go do something physical outside. So for the longest time, I didn't read. I continued to write. My writing was Saturday and Sunday morning. So I'd get up at five o'clock Saturday, Sunday morning and write for a few hours, which isn't a great way to write because you've got all week uh, in between. And the work can sometimes look choppy um, from weekend to weekend. And during the editing process, you have to go back through and make sure everything flows nicely. So all of those other things that I did got in the way of writing. Now, living on Gabriola, I'm writing again. It's feeling, it feels good to write. What's the view like from where you're riding on Gabriel Island? I gather you don't have a lake that you can stare into the far distance and conjure up these mythical beings. So uh, is that affecting your uh, what you're seeing and thinking? That you uh, do you, do you have a view that you can keep looking far out to? Not into the distance. The view has changed. When we got to this house that I'd never seen before I bought it. And we're looking, for, I was looking around through the rooms for a space for my, to write. It was a little room that didn't have any heat in it. It had a huge sliding glass window, uh, like a balcony door that looked out into the garden. And the garden is all flowers and cherry trees. It is, uh, it's beauty. And I'm sure that that's impacting what I write because when I'm stuck, I turn and look out that window and look at the flowers and look at the trees. Yeah, and the ideas come. So I consciously, we discussed this before we um, uh, came on stream here, uh, didn't want to spend a lot of time going over your biography, because I presume that people 
know roughly your story and you can read the dust jacket and it tells us about all the jobs and interesting things you did. But um, I believe you have not just one, but three uh, books in various states of incubation right now, including a biography. Uh, so uh, we are about to get the full biography of Harold Johnson. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting writing it. Or an autobiography, I guess I should say. Yeah. Writing the biography gave me insight into myself. I'm writing all of this stuff and realize that I'm writing about work. I'm writing about all of the work that I did as a miner, as a lumberjack, tree planter, firefighter, um, all of it, mechanic, marine engineer in the Navy. And it was all about the work. And I realized that's who I was. That's who I identified as. I, my identity came out of my work. And this writing thing, well, it was an inner part of me. It was in, entwined with my spirit, wasn't growing. I mean, I managed to get 10 books out during that time, but now I'm free from work. And my definition of me isn't tied to what I do. Only now, only now in this last year, can I say I'm a pure writer. This is who I am. Not just in my spirit, but mentally, emotionally, physically. I am a writer. And it's my goal to create art. And develop this writing craft. So one of the other books that you're... Um... I think have completed, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, is a book about the power of story. Um, without giving the book away, um, tell us what we can look forward to in that book, because that does seem, you know, the Bjorkens, for instance, your relatives, the trees, <laughs> um, uh, in the sagas, uh, primarily storytellers. Um, yes. uh, so this, this sort of redounds wherever you look in Harold Johnson's work and life, this notion of the power of story is absolutely central. So tell us more about how you uh, see the power of story uh, manifest, not just in your own work, but in the work of others and people who came be before you. Where did it come from is a question I frequently ask myself. It started with a conversation with another Crown prosecutor. We were talking about something and I, it was my turn to respond. And my mouth said, we have to change the story we tell ourselves. And my mouth said it before my brain kicked in. And I was surprised that those words came. And shortly after that, I was in Sweden and we were on a long road trip for, uh, around the Baltic Sea. And I got lots of time to sit in a vehicle that I wasn't responsible for driving and spend time thinking about story. What is story? Um, and it began putting it together. So by the time I get to writing Firewater, I've got this thesis worked out that story is everything. I am story, you are story, the universe is story. And stories are extremely powerful. Stories can kill you, stories can heal you. And law, law is all about fiction. 
private property doesn't exist in reality. It's a fiction we made up. So is most of law. Property is probably the biggest fiction. Money is a fiction. Take your wallet out and look. You see that money is just a piece of paper. But the story behind it is so powerful that people will kill you for it. Money is such an incredible fiction right now that it's lost touch with reality. There's a quadrillion dollars worth of derivatives traded in the market every year. A quadrillion is a million billion or a billion million. It's a one with 15 zeros behind it. It would pay for everything that humanity has produced in the last hundred years. That's how far out of touch money is with reality. It's a, money is a fantasy. And we've got all of these fictions and fantasies going on in our world and we believe them. And we reify them and we make them real and we kill each other for them. Sovereignty is just a story. A man named Vittoria made it up in 1532. And he did it to take rights away from Aboriginal people. And primarily what sovereignty means is anybody but Aboriginal people. So, got this powerful story that 50 million people died in the mass murder event we call the Second World War because of a story, a story about sovereignty. We've got many of these stories and I'm just, the power of story is probably, not probably, the power of story is the most important work that I have ever done. So when you think about where we are in this country, this world right now, um, Especially, perhaps, you know, um, you know, we celebrated a holiday last week. Um, uh, some of us on the beach, um, uh, some of us not. Um, in terms of uh, uh, truth and reconciliation, um, uh, it occurs to me that the colonizers were pretty smart because the thing that they actually went out to do to basically get their version of what your know, civilization looked like was to try and remove the storytelling ability of indigenous people. Yes. They were, they were pretty tuned into what, <laughs> what you were saying and they just decided they needed to control the narrative and they still are. They still do. Um, Gutenberg gave them a powerful tool, the printing press. You can control what's printed. You control what's what people are thinking, control thought, control actions. And the oral tradition that I come from can't compete with that. So we just had a day to remember, September 30th. And it's a good, good holiday and we should remember. But we have to be careful with it because Kichwamanawa controls the narrative. Kichwamanawa is a Cree word that means our cousins. And I get to that word because <clears throat> my elders told me that the treaties were adoption ceremonies and we adopted the queen's children to be our cousins. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to share this land. So instead of calling them settlers or white people, uh, follow what my elders say and call them Kichwamanawa. And Kichwamanawa controls the narrative and the narrative for the longest time is that Aboriginal people are victims, that they should be pitied. And we're not. 
We're doctors, we're lawyers, we're judges, we're architects, we're engineers, we're nurses, we're school teachers, we're social workers, we're trappers, we're fishermen. Yeah, we're bootleggers and drug dealers too, but we're not victims. If you tell the story of us as victims, <clears throat> we'll never rise above it. Residential school was a bitch, but I can't fix it. Colonization was a horror. And all of the trauma from day one, I mean, trauma began before residential schools. Trauma began when our population was decimated by diseases we had no medicine for. We lost our leaders, we lost our thinkers, we lost our medicine people. Our population was completely traumatized by the time we got the treaty. And then shortly after treaty, we got an Indian Act, it confined us to reserves and then residential schools we were tortured and raped, traumatized more. And and when they were shut down and we got the scoops and all of the stories about us is that we're victims. And victim is a nocebo story. The more we tell that story to each other and, uh, and about ourselves, the weaker we become. We need hero stories. And that's partially what I'm trying to write. I'm trying to write some hero stories. Give people some hope. So you are also, I think, um, part of a, a sort of genre busting, if you will, group of writers, many of them uh, Indigenous people, who really are starting to advance a very different narrative in this country. Um, does, does that give you hope, You're, you know, that, that there are so many good storytellers that probably even 10 or 15 or 20 years ago we would have ignored that we're now you know, really having to pay attention to and <laughs> sort of actually relearning ourselves how we think about things and how we live on this land together. Is that a source of hope to you? It's beautiful. Tracy Lindbergh, Birdie, uh, Eden Robinson and the, the Trickster series. Mm -hmm. Richard Van Camp. You know, Richard can't speak without telling a story. Mm -hmm. Lee Miracle. Lee Miracle who understands, understands that it's all about the land and that's where the stories come from. And yeah, we're not, we're no longer bound by genre. We were taught in those traditional stories that our mothers told us and our grandmothers told us, those stories were our education. And they were about the trickster. They were about people who could fly. They were magic. And they were real. And they told about who we are and where we came from. And they were star stories. First Nations, we've been, our oral history is full of science fiction and we've been traveling the stars for a long time. We know about journeys across the galaxy and it's coming out. And the industry doesn't really know what to do with us. We're, we're putting this stuff out there. Is it fiction or is it nonfiction? Which shelf does it go on? Which catalog do we put this in? Oh no. We're doing it. And there's lots of us. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. And I have to say the Bjork and Sagas is a beautiful example. There's people flying around. <laughs> there's a lot of flying going on. Yeah. Um, it's really magic, and uh, I just think it's. Uh, I guess what I uh, wonder about is um, your um, how you manage what 
must be an incredible tension because your um, nonfiction, your peace and good order, which I think, as you know, in at Upstart and Crow, we've sold more of that book than any other book. Uh, partly because when people come to the store, we make them buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're going to read something, read this. <laughs> you know. Um, but also uh, living in a kind of tension between describing what you did in Peace and Good Order and in Firewater and actually the books around, you know, just um, the treatment of Indigenous people in this country and around the world. Uh, and then sort of going into this... Um, or, or by comparison, almost ornate kind of mythological world that you've created, um, uh, which does seem more form of, I mean, there's, there's agony and ecstasy in the Bjork and Sagas too, but there's a great deal of beauty in it too. So is, is that how you manage the sort of tension between the ugliness you see in the world and the beauty that you describe in the introduction to your book, you know, this beautiful planet of ours? I mean, you how do you manage that tension so well? When I worked in the range as a crown prosecutor and before that as defense counsel, I lived on my trap line and it was a 50 mile drive from town to the cabin down an old gravel road. And Joan and I counted chickens on the road and rabbits and we'd see lynx and wolves and occasionally a moose. And that distance between town and the cabin didn't allow work to ever come home. Hmm. Somewhere on that road, we left work behind and home never made it to work. So we lived in, well, I did, I lived in two separate worlds. And I had this 50 mile transition between them that give me the distance. So when I'm home and writing, I'm not immersed in the structures of modern society. And I could, from that distance, take apart those structures, show how those structures work mostly how they don't work. And then just the beauty of where I was with um, dog teams, nature, mm -hmm. our gardens. If I wanted a fish, I walked to the end of the dock and threw it out a hook. And just being taken care of, knowing that the creator was looking after me, which was a an early lesson that was taught to me on the trap line that don't worry about stuff. Creator, look after you. When you need it, it'll come. Which is completely diff different from that world of structures where you have to earn everything and you have to beat everybody out of the way to get what you what you want. And you have to fight. Two different worlds and i wrote in one and lived in the other and then they came and cut down the trees and they cut down all the trees mm -hmm. harold we have some questions um from the audience uh so if you wouldn't mind i'll jump to them because uh well we could talk for hours <laughs> we're good <laughs> well we're going to <laughs> but but um uh, I'd love to just get a couple of other questions in here. So Ryan asks, so with Firewater turning five this year, what has impacted you most from that book? Firewater doesn't belong to me anymore. I wrote that book. <clears throat> I sat down to write it August, 1st of August, 2015. By November, I had a completed draft. I took it to the publisher, University of Regina Press. I pitched it for 45 minutes. They agreed to publish it and moved it to the front of their list. And they had a five-year backlog. By September of 2016, I had a copy of it in my hand. 
13 months after I sat down to write it, I had a physical copy in my hand. Two weeks later, it was shortlisted for a Governor General's Award. That opened doors to the bigger publishing houses for me <clears throat> and changed things. When I got word that it was shortlisted for a Governor General's, I went outside, had a coffee, and came back in, told my wife, Joan, our lives have changed. Mm -hmm. have in a good way. Shortly after its nomination for Governor General's Award, I was sitting in the tourist center in La Ranch, and they sell my books there. It's a good place to visit and have a coffee. And I was just sitting and having a coffee and visiting. And this young lady was in there and she had articles that she was selling at the tourist center as well. And she came over to me and said, you know, Harold, after I read Firewater, I quit drinking. And that hit me pretty hard. Mm. I changed a life. Mm. Uh, as a writer, you write a book and you put it out there and sometimes a critic will say something about it if you're lucky. And you ask your friends, what did you think of it? And they say, oh, it was good, it was good. But you never hear it, never hear the feedback. Now with Firewater, I had 13 people come to me personally and say they have quit drinking because they read that book. And never in that book do I tell anybody to quit drinking. Mm. The sales have not stopped. You publish a book in Canada, you've got one year from the date you publish to get all of your sales done. Uh, next year, there's another 20,000 books out there on the market. Firewater won't stop. They keep sending me royalty checks every year. Mm. It's, that book has taken on a life of its own. So It doesn't feel like it's mine anymore. It feels like the people own that book. It's theirs. That's a beautiful thought. Um, Harold, uh, Cree Simon says, um, uh, asks if uh, the pandemic has affected any part of your newest writing. When the pandemic hit, Joan and I went to the cabin. Um, I remember October of 2019, we were promoting Peace and Good Order, I think. And in the month of October, Joan and I were in 20 different hotels across Canada. It was so good when everything shut down and we just went home and stayed home. And we didn't have to drive to LaRange every day. And we got to see spring come, to watch the ice melt off the lake, to watch the leaves come. And the birds, when the birds came back, you know, to be there to welcome them. Um, no, this pandemic has been a blessing for me. And then we moved from there to Gabriola. And it's a beautiful community and it is community. And as things open up a bit, I'm getting to see a beautiful place that I, I've moved to. But for the most part, we just stayed home. You don't go anywhere without a mask. and um, There isn't a lot of social stuff going on, so you're not meeting people. I got to meet my close neighbors and a few interesting people there. But mostly I just stayed home and went for walks in the forest and looked after the gardens. And put your ass in the chair and wrote. But kept my ass in the chair and I've got a lot of writing done. <laughs> so um, I have one uh, um, comment here in the chat, not a question. Um, Harmony, your daughter, and the kids are watching in Saskatchewan and they're saying how proud they are. So there you go. There's a little family commentary in the chat. 
and if they only knew how proud I am of them. Yeah. Um, uh, Christine asks, what advice do you have for those of us still in northern Saskatchewan regarding the clear-cutting and resource extraction that's obviously still going on? You're going to have to get radical. You're going to have to blockade. You're going to have to get the community together. And you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Aboriginal people have kept their heads down and stayed quiet because First Nations are financially benefiting from the destruction of our territory. But they're not going to keep their head down and keep silent for much longer. I'm hearing the voices begin to rise up. And I'm sorry I'm not there to lead. But like I said, I'm an ineffectual leader. I get too angry. And all I can do is swear at the bastards. Mm. You told me in a previous conversation we had that you felt um, that this whole enterprise we've got going on here in this sort of extractivist country of ours is really on a knife's edge, that, that the warriors have been very close to kind of unleashing their power. Do you, um, do you, do you feel that we're sort of in powder keg country at the moment? It's scary. When the Métis got their hunting rights in Saskatchewan, the provincial government issued conservation officers sidearms. When the Gerald Stanley trial was completed, and for those who don't know, Gerald Stanley is the man who got away with murdering an Aboriginal person, was found not guilty even though he shot the young man in the head. At the conclusion of that trial, the Saskatchewan government issued conservation officers assault rifles. That government is preparing for a race war. And is what we're seeing in Ferry Creek closer to home now for you? Does that feel close to home for you too? I know this isn't your territory, but you don't speak for you or anyone but yourself, but does that feel like an extension of the same thing? It is. Industry is in control. Non-entities, corporations, have no body to kick and no soul to damn. Fictions that we created in law are now in control. And they've been getting their way for so long that they think it's natural, normal, and necessary that they continue to get their way. And anybody who stands up and says, no, the evidence shows that what you're doing is destructive. They attack the person who said it instead of the idea. Yeah, and you can't help but think we're in for a long, hard haul over not just old growth, but pretty much everything that's fueled this country for the last 200 years. Yeah. You're beautiful, beautiful lamp. Forests are full of spirits that can heal you. Good health out there. In the anxiety and depression, mental health aren't just problems for Aboriginal people who are suffering through trauma. These are problems for all of society. Imagine there's hundreds of thousands of people here in the city of Vancouver 
who could benefit from a walk in the forest. And we're cutting it down. We're destroying that which makes us healthy. And it's not just the forests. Now they're coming for the peat moss. The oil, uranium, everything. And we've been mining and logging this country for so long that those resources are running out. And there's only 2.7% of old growth forest left in British Columbia. And less every day. And less every day. And as a, the resource runs out, industry demands government give them more and more. And they'll take the last tree if there's a profit to be made. Yeah. Well, and there uh, we're looking at the last fish in the case of salmon too. Yeah. Um, another question. The last caribou. Yep. Yeah. Another question, uh, Harold. Um, there's so much for us to begin to solve for, so much for us to fight against a change. At times, uh, like these art can feel almost indulgent or less of a priority. What you said here tonight goes against that, but can you speak to the ability of art to fight injustice and how art can balance with more direct action? Art is changing the story. That's what we're doing. And I believe all artists do it, whether you're medium is paint or film or literature, you're changing the story. You're the leaders. You are leading society. You're giving them an imagined future that they can head towards. Don't worry about the politicians. The politicians are not leaders. Politicians depend on the poles of the direction that the public is going in. And when they determine what direction the public is heading in, they run out front and pretend they're leading. Okay. The artists are the leaders. You're imagining futures for people to find as a direction. And when the people start moving in a direction, nothing is going to stop them. So instead of trying to elect uh, a lesser evil political party to go to Ottawa and make change, make change in your community. Pull your community together. You make community by having a wiener roast. You make community every time you have a feast. You make community every time you pull people together to do something and you keep building community and you keep allowing people to imagine alternative futures and they'll choose the alternative future that best suits them. Mm -hmm. um, Harold, one more question uh, from the chat. Um, Curtis asks, what you're currently reading. So what are the stories that you're gravitating towards now? What did I read today was Robert Sawyer, mm. Calculating God. And it's, it's science fiction. Mm -hmm. And it's damn good science fiction because the science in it is real. And it's this discussion about evolution. Is evolution even possible? Um, or was there a hand that designed it? And he's written it into a fiction and it's powerful. It's making me think. Mm -hmm. 
um, which makes me think that uh, you're going to write some more fantasy. <laughs> Is that right? I believe that the very next book after the two we discussed uh, will be a fantasy. Well, I uh, don't presume to speak for anybody but myself, but I imagine that there's a lot of people out there who firstly are going to be thrilled to finally get their hands on a copy of Bjork and Sagas and to read this beautiful mythical um, creation that you've uh, gifted us, uh, Harold. Um, the other thing I would just say is, you know, when you were talking about um, Firewater a minute ago, and you said that you you had this revelation of having changed a life, and then having changed thirteen lives, and what have you. And it does occur to me that it's fitting to say, Harold, that you through your work, not just through that book, through Peace and Good Order, through the sagas, through you you are changing a lot of people's lives um, for the better. Uh, and I really think it's my duty to <laughs> on behalf of people who are listening tonight but just generally uh to thank you for that you know artists are the leaders um uh this imagined future you talk about is absolutely within the grasp of um all of us to not just imagine but to to bring into being through art and through activism and through sharing stories. Um, so through your storytelling, you've changed a lot of lives, Harold, and thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Harold, you will be appearing soon at the Vancouver's Writers' Festival. So um, I just want to put in a plug for the Writers' Festival. Uh, I uh, hope that people who've um, listened in on our conversation this evening will join you again at the Writers' Fest. Uh, and I urge people to pick up a copy of um, the Bjork and Sagas from an independent bookstore, wherever you can get to one of those. Uh, and uh, please support Harold's beautiful storytelling and support your independent bookstores. And uh, again, Harold, thank you so much for these tremendous contributions you've made um, to our country and to our thinking about what our we want our country to look like. And we should just get on out there and get the country we want. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you down the 50 mile gravel road somewhere, <laughs> leaving it all behind us. Thanks so much, Harold. And thank you for allowing me into this beautiful store, the Upstart and Crow. Is... Thank you. Well, we'll this see you when the revolution there. begins. <laughs> Viva la revolution. Okay. Thank you so much, Harold. We'll see you soon. Goodbye. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Good evening. Okay.